After such a wonderful and astonishing display of, display of eloquence and uh, knowledge <laughs> and so on, I really feel, I feel really like a soccer player having to face Argentina. <laughs> okay. So I decided to concentrate my uh, comments on uh, geometry and quantum mechanics. One of the deepest results in quantum field theory is that in the relativistic quantum field theory vacuum, an accelerated observer sees a temperature. This is a quite non-trivial generic prediction of quantum field theory um, that comes both of a joining of re relativity and quantum mechanics. Of course, it's well known. It's, um, and it's recently been used uh, in an important way to understand deep results of quantum field theory. Um, now, there seems to be an emergent connection be between geometry and thermodynamics. Um, and of course, there are many ways of going from geometry to thermodynamics. The previous one that we just saw is between the relativistic geometry of Minkowski space to uh, thermodynamics in the Rindler wedge. With gravity, we have the near horizon uh, geometry and uh, the finite temperature of black holes. And we understand in great detail various aspects of black holes, uh, BPS counting with exquisite detail, even uh, up to the integer factors as we saw in um, Dalbolkar's talk. We understood recently the second law of uh, thermodynamics, thanks to work by, by Wald. And and we also have exact descriptions from far away afforded to us by matrix theory and ADS-CFT and so on. So if we stand from the safety of the boundary, uh, we understand uh, black holes very well if we stand uh, there. Uh, but if we go inside, then we quickly fall into quicksand. And the reason is that uh, though we know the connection between geometry and thermodynamics uh, fairly well, the, con the relationship between thermodynamics and geometry, or entanglement uh, going to geometry, is not very clear. So how does the interior arise? Um, without smoothness at the horizon, even uh, the simplest prediction of uh, the Hawking temperature is not valid anymore. Now, Maros Alponshinsky claimed they, they did. However, they assumed this uh, connection between ER to EPR, which is part of the thing that I think we need to understand better. Um, so we have all these uh, questions. Now, a popular view is that the interior is some kind of average, some kind of average thermodynamical property. And I think that the recent uh, papers have shown that this is not as usual. So we cannot think of measurements done in the interior as the expectation values of fixed operators, where the observer is doing some observation from outside, not included in the system. So now I have a, a prediction, uh, which is that We'll understand it. It will be simple. And it will probably have profound in implications for cosmology. But also, I think that a specially solvable example in string theory will probably be a key, which uses many of the details of string theory, perhaps. Um, so this is an area where probably some rigor will be good. Um, and we'll probably be able to have it all, unitarity from the outside and a reasonably smooth interior. And that, seeing how to achieve that will be very, very good. Um, now, here we have a duality between the bulk geometry and the microstates. And in dualities, whenever we, in the past, whenever we found a contradiction, it was because we were not uh, being careful enough. Uh, so, per this, as Einstein told us, subtle is the Lord, but not malicious. Um, so, probably the combination of all the recent ideas will be important for understanding uh, how to solve this problem. Um, now, there is a nice uh, toy example I, well, that people often mention. I like to mention it again. So if you just consider a matrix integral, uh, this is just an ordinary integral. But there is a geometry behind these integrals, the geometry of a Riemann surface, which is produced when we solve the matrix model in the planar approximation. And if you consider the, an observable like the determinant uh, of the matrix, um, this observable in the large end limit is given by a function which actually lives on this Riemann surface, on the geometry. It has two values. So if you go through this cut, uh, you have another value. Uh, on the other hand, the original observable doesn't, well, has a unique, it's completely analytic for finite n. So it feels that maybe the black hole interior is something like this. And of course, understanding uh, how, how this could work is, would be very interesting. 
Um, I think one element that is uh, it's probably very important is that the observer is part of the system. And we only uh, are required to reproduce what the observer can actually see. Now, this is a common feature of, uh, of um, this is a common feature in gravi if gravitational field uh, of thermodynamics in the presence of a gravitational field. If we have thermal equilibrium in the presence of a gravitational field, the proper uh, velocities of these molecules is bigger than the velocities of this molecule. And if you're naive, you might think that you might be able to run a heat engine uh, taking profit of that fact. And of course, uh, this is not possible because everyone is subject to the same redshift. Now, the black hole problem is just an extreme version of this, where we have uh, the observer on the other side of the horizon. So if you have an object falling into the black hole, um, this, this, this person who's falling into the black hole has to be sufficiently different from the vacuum. And there's a way to quantify how sufficiently different from the vacuum it is, which is this relative entropy formula. Um, and this quantity actually measures uh, how much entropy the black hole, how much the entropy of the final black hole will be after the object have fall has fallen in. So here we see uh, that when we make uh, more and more, send, send into the black hole more and more complex objects, uh, we really will increase the entropy of the final black hole. So it's impossible to perform a sophisticated measurement without uh, sending something in and without increasing the entropy of the black hole in a significant way. Um, so I think that's probably going to be an important uh, aspect. And again, I think we really need to understand how, uh, how it is that uh, we get this connection between, from entanglement and how this works and how this is supposed to uh, emerge from the theory. It would be very nice to understand. Um, and well, uh, since we have immersion time in the interior, it's probably that the quantum mechanics in the interior emerges in some way. And I don't have anything more to say than this uh, simple thing. OK, so now I'd like to change topics slightly um, and um, talk a bit about space-time and quantum mechanics. Now, it, it's uh, often said that the quantum mechanics of space-time is irrelevant and measurable, and unmeasurable, because it involves very high energies and so on. Now, this, this point is actually incredibly wrong, so it's very wrong. Um, in fact, the shape of our space-time at long distances is determined by quantum fluctuations. And through Hawking radiation, the same effect, the same deep result about quantum field theory we discussed in the beginning. And this is a generic prediction from inflation. Um, and these fluctuations are even crucial for our existence. So quantum mechanics and gravity, rather than being something irrelevant, is something actually crucial for explaining the biggest features in the universe. Um, now, is there more? I mean, can we say a little more? Um, now, there is... Um, one thing, one historical, well, Greg already referred to this, the black body problem. So people who looked at black bodies uh, at, the beginning, at the end of the 1900s, they found that applying the rules they knew, they got uh, infinite results, results that didn't make sense, infinite entropy, infinite energy for a black body. Um, now, there were some solutions that one could think about. So for example, you could say, well, maybe the black body didn't have time to equilibrate. Maybe it is true that uh, you get this infinite energy, but it didn't have enough time to equilibrate. Or, of course, the right answer was quantum mechanics. Now, I think what we have today in uh, quantum gravity is an infrared catastrophe. So we can, uh, for example, in the theory of inflation, we can compute the probabilities of curvature fluctuations with great detail and in a way that uh, compares very well with experiment. But we cannot, but if we try to compute um, more, uh, more uniform properties, let's say the zeroth mode of curvature. So if the uniform part of the curvature, is it 10 to the minus 5 as the other, or is it 10 to the minus 3? Is it positive, is it ne negative? Now, there is one way of calculating this, which is the hardwell hawking proposal, which is just the direct extension of the method that is used to calculate the other fluctuations. And this method gives something that doesn't make sense. It, it just really disagrees with experiment. Now, what could you say? So you could say, well, maybe we're out of equilibrium. Uh, or you could say, well, maybe we really need to understand the theory better. And once we understand the theory better, we'll um, probably find that at longer distances, quantum effects are perhaps even larger. And that perhaps quantum gravity, when properly understood, describes this in a surprisingly simple and non-classical and non-semi-classical explanation. Um, and probably the correct answer we cannot be easily imagined. Uh, certainly, I cannot easily imagine it. 
because I'm too uh, used to semi-classical approximations, but maybe some of you might be able to imagine them, uh, hopefully. Now, I'd like now to turn to a more practical problem. So the Planck scale seems to be far away, so I don't know why. It seems very far away. Uh, so how can we expect to be able to collide gravitons at very high energies? Uh, some people have even suggested that it is actually impossible to do in our universe. Um, but I think that we can. And so we really have uh, this 10 to the 14 GeV cosmological collider with some optimism, assuming the bicep results hold up. Maybe they don't, probably, but maybe it's a little lower than 10 to the 14, but maybe we can be optimistic. Um, we have a very weakly coupled theory, um, and we need to le learn to read off the results. We really need to learn how these collisions that, that occurred in the early universe translate into observables uh, today. And we have a situation similar to what we have in the LHC. We have a collision uh, occurring, or some process that occurred and produced this MS. And from this mess, we should be able to figure out uh, what happened. So in the universe, we instead of having hadrons and so on, we have galaxies. But from the distribution of these galaxies, we uh, should be able to figure out the initial nonlinearities, the initial uh, classical collisions between the quantum gravitons that um, existed during the early universe. Um, so in other words, from the galaxies, we'll figure out the equations that uh, hopefully will agree with string theory. I'm glad that um, Robert uh, chose the right colors to draw this in. The future is coming fast. And usually, in this kind of talks, people ask, what is string theory? And uh, there are all kinds of deep uh, discussions of this. So I'd like to propose some answer. So um, I do think that. And I, and I do think that uh, really we are studying natural geometric structures, the natural structures of quantum field theory, uh, quantum gravity, um, of Einstein, and so on. They are the structures we know are correct that describe nature at the scales we, we know, and we are trying to explore them in more generality. And I think that's uh, some of the essence of string theory. Thank you. <laughs>